Dr. Gellman. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here till the very last minute. I hope you will, you will not run away in the middle of the talk. Uh, okay, so this is work um, we have done. Part of the things I'm going to talk about we have done in collaboration with Santiago Osorio and Diego Rosales, and I will mention some new things that are still ongoing where a new PhD student, Vishalva, with uh, the co-direction of uh, Flavia, who is here, uh, are going on, and also some, uh, some things we are doing to, uh, with another researcher. We are all now in, uh, well, University of La Plata is quite generic, so we are all at IPDC, so this uh, the institute that was mentioned many times. And uh, so I, I'm, I will try to say a few words about uh, how ischemia lattices uh, show up and how they may combine in uh, frustrated lattices, in particular in anti-ferromagnetic uh, magnets, to lead to some kind of a state two vortex lattice. Okay. So this is the outline of the talk. So I will uh, start. Uh, with some uh, history of uh, how schemions uh, appeared in the literature, then in experiments more recently. And uh, I will discuss uh, in some detail uh, results in the ferromagnetic case where you add a dialoshinsky moria interaction term, and how in the presence of magnetic field, this uh, schemulus is first, uh, uh, first predicted and then observed experimentally. Then I will move to what we have done, that is to, to <coughs> treat a similar problem, but now in an anti-ferromagnetic model. Uh, essentially, this is uh, the main change, uh, but uh, the results are quite different, in fact. And we have, uh, well, I will tell you what, is what I mean with this anti-ferromagnetic schema lattice. I will show you the phase diagram in a field, the low energy Hamiltonian, and then some uh, applications or some further uh, possible work well, some lines that we are already uh, developing. Please feel, feel free to put into the, uh, interrupt me with questions whenever I feel it necessary. Okay, so this is a very uh, fast uh, uh, history of schemians. So they were introduced in this paper by Skirme in 1962. And more to the point of uh, my talk, the paper in 1975 studied by Belavin and Polyakov, studied uh, the case uh, in two plus one dimensions. In particular, if you look at the static solutions of the two dimensional uh, nonlinear sigma model, which, uh, well, if you start from an isotropic ferromagnet, so here, let me just clarify what I mean with these guys. So this is S is normalization, and N will be a unit vector. <coughs> And uh, so if you study the continuum limit of this uh, ferromagnet Ham Hamiltonian, then you go to the nonlinear sigma model description. And uh, what has been uh, shown in this paper is that there exist uh, uh, topologically charged solutions that are metastable solutions that are characterized by this topological charge, which is defined in terms of the spin fields, this uh, density. Uh, okay, so the new thing after many years was that uh, if you include other interactions that break uh, inversion symmetry in particular, for example, the Aloshinsky moria interactions, and uh, then you can uh, cook up some uh, ground states where these schemions uh, condense, and uh, well, I will show you some uh, explicit uh, solutions, which are these uh, schemion lattices. So, uh, okay, so let me start with the basics very quickly. So I start, uh, I have a R2 sp spins on, uh, on, on the plane, so I compactify the plane choosing some particular boundary conditions, so, so I can, uh, so I mean, some homogeneous boundary conditions at infinity, so I can compactify the space, and then I have maps from S2 to S2 that are characterized by this uh, Second homotopy group, and uh, these are just the uh, integers, which is exactly uh, the integers that uh, are written here. And this is just to give you a flavor of what the schemion looks like in a 
reduced uh, infinite plane, let's say, and uh, so you can uh, through the stereographic projection you can uh, have a uh, guys like this, and uh, so these are charge one uh, schemas. So here what you can see is that you go from a uh, uh, up spin so at infinity to down spin. So this will be a kind of a, uh, minimal energy excitation in a ferromagnet background. And, uh, but you can uh, also have a higher charges. Uh, I will show you by the end of the talk that some high charge, not too high, but two charge two schemas have been observed in some materials. And, uh, and uh, okay, to draw these things in uh, for higher charges is more complicated, not that complicated, but uh, it, it's not clear how to draw it in a very efficient way. So this is something I borrowed from the from the internet uh, where you see that this wraps around many times. So the idea is that uh, maybe the analogy with S1 is uh, clearer. So here you have, uh, if you go to one dimension less in both target and, uh, uh, and base space, then you have to deal with pi one of S1, which is also the integer group. And then you can see that if you go once around with your field, when you go once around the coordinates, uh, this is one situation. You can go uh, twice around or three times around and so on. And these configurations of the field are uh, inequivalent. So, and they are characterized by different charges, one, two, three, etc. And here it's easy to see how many times you wrap your field around your space. Here it's more complicated, but the idea is the same. Okay. Uh, so the the more more interesting thing to my from my point of view was when uh, these chiral magnets started uh, to be observed. Yes. Ah, because it's one dimension less of the original uh, scheme. No, but I I hate this baby, so I I don't call them baby scheme. <laughs> I don't hate babies, but this name I hate. Uh, so I think it's w it the original was three plus one, and this is two plus one, and. Okay. Okay. So, uh <coughs> sorry. Yeah. So the first uh, mm, place in the literature with this scheme and uh, lattice arrangement of of these previous configurations, uh, I have uh, deliberately uh, shrink to a small area have been uh, predicted was in a lattice two-dimensional ferromagnet with this uh, dyaroshinsky morilla interaction and the man magnetic field. This is a seminar paper by Bogdanov and Yavronsky. And uh, this, uh, this uh, predicted uh, schemian lattice phases, which are depicted uh, down here, uh, where you can see each of these spots is one schemian of charge one. Uh, were predicted here and observed uh, in 2009 first by Mühlbauer and collaborators in MNSI. Well, MNSI is a three-dimensional material, so uh, phase diagram has some uh, differences with the two-dimensional case, which I will show you in the next uh, slide. But essentially, the physics is similar. The difference is that you need a uh, finite temperature and finite field to, to condensate this phase. And uh, so I will go through the analytics later. Another case which uh, is uh, um, two di more two-dimensional is this uh, uh, iron-based compound. And Münzer et al. just one year after we have observed a similar phase. And in that case, when you have a two-dimensional, this is uh, quite generic. Even if you have a situation like this in a 3D compound, when you make it thinner, then uh, what happens is that the temperatures that you need to have this uh, schemian lattice go down even to zero, as in this case, for example. So this is an experimental phase diagram, magnetic field and temperature. This is a schemian lattice phase. And this is a numerical, <coughs> numerical theoretical uh, uh, evaluation or prediction or fitting of this phase diagram, which fits pretty, pretty nicely by uh, the Hamiltonian I will show you in a minute. And, uh, okay, another comment is that uh, if you what you observe in this schemial lattice phase by small angle neutron scattering is just six-fold, uh, six, six dots reflecting the six-fold uh, symmetry. 
Here I have only this uh, compound with several different uh, filling fractions or doping or uh, but th there are nowadays many, many materials that uh, show up this, uh, this uh <coughs> scheme in lattice. Okay, so let me uh, try to show you, okay, what is the Hamiltonian uh, that has been used here? Essentially the Hamiltonian that was originally proposed in this paper with some variations, but small variations. The basics was there, so it's a ferromagnetic... Uh, uh, as a ferromagnet with the Aloshinsky Moria interaction and a magnetic field. Okay, so let me just uh, go. Uh, I will not make your, your mistake. <laughs> Thanks to you. <laughs> okay, so the idea is uh, to combine the effects of a ferromagnetic or anti ferromagnetic coupling with a magnetic field and the Aloshinsky Moria interaction. So, this is the picture we all know ferromagnetic. Uh -huh. Etc. So, ferromagnetic aligned this, the spins. This is just pictorial. Anti ferromagnetic, anti aligned the spins. And if you are in a frustrated lattice, well, we have already heard about that, so I just uh, flash it. Uh, there is frustration in the lattice for classical spins. This arrangement will be the, the, the right one, but uh, if you have other interactions, then <coughs> you have to see what is the outcome. If you add the dialoshinsky moria interactions, which is uh, typically allowed if in inversion symmetry is broken and it originates uh, from spin orbit interactions, what happens, okay, the, the, ter the energy term that you have is something like this. This D depends on the material, uh, so it, it depends uh, on many, um, in a complicated way, on the structure of the material. And uh, essentially what tells you, for example, if you have a D that points out of the blackboard, one of the minimized, uh, the, the profiles minimizing the energy will be this or the other way around, depending on the sign of D. But you see that this will compete with these two orders, okay? Uh, so typically, this appears in situations like this, when you have two spins and an intermediate uh, atom here breaking the symmetry, then it, this could generate this, this kind of couplings here, okay? Uh <coughs> okay, so what happens if you put uh, dialoshinsky Morilla and ferromagnetic exchange together? Then you will get some kind of spiral. Uh, if you put a magnetic field, you can get some spiral with some uh, uh, conical uh, uh, tilting in the direction of, of the field. But if you combine everything in two dimensions, then you, you can cook up these uh, spaces. Okay? This is one of the models that was used by Nagaos and collaborators. Th so this is uh, after many years after the work by Bogdanova and Jablonski. This is motivated mainly by the materials I have shown you before, the, the experimental observations. So here you see, this is for a cubic lattice, ferromagnetic exchange, so x, y, and z directions. This is just ferromagnetic exchange. Here you have jaloshinsky moria interaction, which in that case, so let me just draw the square lattice case. So in this, uh, Hamiltonian here, the, the, the vectors D point in the directions of the bonds of the lattice, okay? There could be an out-of-plane component, but in that the case, it, uh, with this, it was enough to reproduce the phenomenology. Then the ha you have some extra terms that are needed to fit better the, the experimental results. And the continuum expression of this, so I have already shown you what you get here, Well, I have said what you get here for the two-dimensional case, and uh, I will go down to the two-dimensional case uh, in the next slide. But I even in that case, you get a first term, which is a typical nonlinear sigma model term. Of course, you have the constraint, because these are spins, uh, classical spins, so you have this uh, uh, modulus one constraint. You have the, the fate of this term here, of the dialoshinsky moria term, is given here. So you get something like n dot of n, and then a magnetic field. So with this very simple uh, Ginsburg-Landau uh, model, you can uh, reproduce m much of the phase diagram. 
So let me. So this is for the non-frustrated uh, case. So square lattice, even triangular lattice, but uh, ferromagnetic. What happens if you move to? Uh, and okay, let me say something else. So here, uh, in this case, I have mentioned before that you have uh, mappings from S2 to S2. Okay, so this is the uh, base space and this is the target space because this is, well, in this Ginsburg Landau description, this will be the order parameter which is in, uh, lives in S2. And then you have the important thing is pi 2, <coughs> sorry, pi 2 of S2 is Z, Z. Okay? So what happens? How does this changes when one moves to uh, the antiferromagnetic triangular lattice? Well, the picture changes completely because now the order parameter is no longer S2 but SO3. Okay? And that means that uh, if you care about this, uh, the equivalent of this, the pi 2 of SO3 is trivial. So there are no skirmians in this, in this theory. As in this case, there are no vortices, okay? C can you say? This, yes. The values, you mean? I think uh, they fit A1, A2, and K. From what I know, they are fitted by fitting. Well, not that I know. B but maybe they, they have some method. Well, so for example, they, they fit uh, here, right? So you have this, uh, this, all these images here, and you have to reproduce this phase diagram. So this is, I guess, this is from neutron scattering. And uh, but there are other experiments to f also to fit. Hmm. I'm a theorist, but uh, let me remember. So uh, somebody can help me in the audience. That I don't know. Uh, but I can look it up, and uh, and now I have started. Like we started some uh, some collaboration with uh, experimentalists in uh, PSI in, s in Switzerland, and I know they do scattering, but they do they use other techniques. But now I, I I don't remember. Yeah, NMR they do NMR too, but uh, they di they use different techniques to fit different things. So, but maybe I can look it up and give you a better answer, okay? So from what I know and what we did numerically is to fit a phase diagram, okay? <coughs> okay, so what happens in the anti-ferromagnetic uh, triangular lattice? So uh, as I was saying, the order parameter now is SO3. So let me complete the picture to compare with, uh, with this case. In this case, what is non-trivial is a pi 1, okay? So you have vortices, but particular set two vortices. So uh, we have uh, a trivial configuration and a vortex which uh, uh, if you duplicate uh, it will become a, a, a trivial vortex. Okay. So the first time that this was to my knowledge analyzed in the literature was uh, in a simple case where you have a two-dimensional Heisenberg antiferromagnet and you study what happens with temperature. So this is a number of vortices as a function of the temperature and at zero and low temperatures, you have uh, no vortices, but they start to proliferate as in a co type of costa Lithaulis transition at some temperature. And here, these are, well, these are very old snapshots. I, we have some nicer now, uh, where you see that as you increase the temperature, more and more C2 vortices uh, in pairs show up. This was studied by Kawamura and Miyashita in this paper in 1984, and they have shown that there is a not exactly KT transition, but a kind of uh, costa Lithaulis transition in the sense that you get uh, proliferation of vortices with temperature. The difference is that here are 
different vertices, Z2 vertices, and the other difference is that both phases are massive, while in the costar lithables you have one phase which is uh, quasi long range order uh, and then you have a massive phase. So here both, uh, both phases are massive with different uh, uh, behaviors, so there is this vorticity function, these are details I will not uh, discuss, but essentially the my main point here is uh, to recover the result. I you have topologically, you have uh, not uh, no, no skirmions, but you may have vortices and these vortices start to show up at uh, finite temperature. So what happens? Yes. Both are massive and this is the, they define this uh, vorticity function and uh, they can see that for high, for uh, temperatures higher than uh, than uh, the critical temperature or lower, it behaves like an area law and a linear law. So, so and this vorticity function has to, yes, uh, it's very similar to that, yes, okay. Okay, so uh, to finish with this uh, short uh, introduction about topology in the, uh, in the triangular lattice for antiferromagnets, so we have this Kawamura Miyashita paper showing that these guys were there at final temperature. Uh, there was uh, another paper uh, later on in by Dombre and Reed in 1989 where they derive the low energy description of this, uh, so in analogy with your paper by, well, I don't know who was the first to derive this uh, nonlinear sigma model, but the paper, the mm, the uh, effective action discussed in by Belavin and Polyakov to uh, see whether there was chemians. And this, in this case, uh, there is uh, an analogous uh, effective action, which is now a kind of, uh, well, it's a nonlinear sigma model for a SO3 field. So as I said, pi 2 of SO3 is zero, so there are no skirmions, but there are vortices. And these are the two, two pictures uh, for different vortices. This is uh, recycled in nicer colors from the original paper by Kawamura and Miyashita. So essentially what you see is that now you have this SO3 order parameter. That means that you have triangles. And you have to see triangles with three spins. So essentially, <coughs> maybe I should have said that. So if you, if you have the triangular lattice, you will have an arrangement like this. So this is why you have now an SO3 order parameter. And uh, here, the what I'm depicting here is uh, one kind of vortex, and here another kind of vortex, not to enter into details. And they have uh, charge one, but different uh, energies. And uh, so the what we did was to start from uh, a very simple model. So this is a triangular, now antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. This is uh, the analogous of uh, this dialoshinsky moria interaction I draw here for the square. So these were the dialoshinsky moria interaction vectors. Here, in our case, we took them by analogy along the... <coughs> in the direction of the bonds. Of course, you may ask the question, are these uh, present in different materials? Well, it would depend on the material, of course. You need some breaking of the uh, inversion symmetry to have these guys there. Uh, but in principle, uh, they could be there and, well, we don't have a, a candidate material, but some uh, experimentalists said that it is not uh, completely impossible, so, but okay. We have to work to get them. Uh, so for the moment, I will just describe our uh, uh, analytical results uh, and numerics. And uh, well, we have a magnetic field. So essentially, this is the lattice. These are the basis vectors. And these are the deloshinsky moria interactions. And this is the <coughs> what one should compare with uh, this uh, picture I have shown you before. OK, this is, uh, looks nicer. Here you identify clearly the the schemians and now what you see is that there, there are some spots that one has to characterize okay so this is what I'm going to try to do in the in the remaining of the talk uh, to tell you a bit about this uh, this uh, new intermediate state so these states appears at some intermediate magnetic field 
for a non-vanishing uh, dialoshinsky mori uh, interaction. So essentially, if you split this um, snapshot by sublattice, then you get on each of the sublattices uh, schemion uh, lattice okay, of the previous type. So well this is a nice uh, description. So you have three intertwined uh, schemion lattices that uh, lead to this, uh, this thing here. This is for B over J equal one half and some uh, large magnetic field. And uh, so we are, well, I, I was convinced that these uh, bubbles here uh, were carrying some uh, set two vortex charge, but uh, we are still uh, trying to characterize this uh, precisely. What I can tell you first is that, okay, at first we called this anti-ferromagnetic scheme in lattice, but uh, then this uh, became confusing because uh, this is what one would call an anti-ferromagnetic schemion. So you have the schemion is uh, on top of a ferromagnetic background. You flip one spin and you get this uh, uh, this uh, picture I have shown you before. What happens in an anti-ferromagnet? Well, it is this here. So you have uh, essentially the same schemion on top of an anti-ferromagnetic uh, background. So this is what one should call an anti-ferromagnetic schemion. <coughs> this uh, apparently they are starting to con being able to construct these uh, coupling nanodisks in this uh, uh, very efficient way to to generate these anti-ferromagnetic schemions, but this has nothing to do with this here. Okay, here you have uh, uh, on each sublattice of the triangular lattice a ferromagnetic schemion lattice. Okay, so this was uh, this is uh, mm, one of the first com computations that were done. Uh, th this this picture is from uh, Diego Rosales, where he computed the vortex number following the mm, prescription by Kawamura Miyashita. So this is the vortex function I, I was showing you before. U is the matrix that rotates along some given path along around the singularity. Okay, <coughs> and this is uh, the the rotation matrices that. Uh, tell you how how this guy uh, wraps or wins around the singularity. So this is a usual uh, um, vector chirality. And uh, so thi this, what is uh, measured here is the vortex number computed around different loops. So that, that's why you get many points. So each of these many sets of points should correspond to one vortex, okay? And this is the number of vortex vortices as a function of the magnetic field. So let me show you the phase diagram from Monte Carlo simulation. So this is temperature, and this is magnetic field. <coughs> so at low ma with with a dialoshinsky mori term. and what we observe here are three phases, or maybe four, that uh, we are still trying to characterize. So one is clear spiral phase on top of some antiferromagnetic background. So this is the three sublattices, okay? So you see a spiral on top of this 120 degree structure. And then you have this chira, this um, schemion lattice, uh, three schemion lattices intertwined, which uh, reproduce this uh, this uh, complete diagram. And then when you increase further this magnetic field, what happens is that uh, you polarize the, the schemions. If you look per sublattice, these blue regions, which means that the spins are pointing opposite to the field, will polarize and you will ar arrive to some region where schemion number per sublattice is zero, but the vortex number is non-zero, okay? So this intermediate region here, uh, we don't yet have a para order parameter to characterize. Well, we have what I have just said. Here we have zero schemion number per sublattice and zero vortex number. Here in this intermediate region, this number is non zero, <coughs> and here is zero, and the vortex number is non zero all along this uh, phase. But uh, okay, we, prefer we would like to have a better description. So let me go back to this uh, vortex number, so this is zero for the spiral phase, then you have some uh, constant, uh, like a plateau in the vortex number in this region here, and then when you move into this region here, the vortex number starts to 
well, this is numerically, no? Okay, the numerically obtained. So this will be a smooth, smooth, smooth decrease of this uh <coughs> vortex number. Wha th and the transition here will correspond to when you polarize, uh, com when you kill the negative component uh, of the of the magnetization. Okay. So well, motivated by this uh, by this description here. We so how to describe the continuum, uh, or how to compute a continuum effective action in the low energy limit. So Dombra and Reed, what they did was to start from the order parameter, which is an e SO3 field, as I said, and then you get some uh, some well some effective action uh, that uh, we. We are trying to generalize to this case, so that means that you have to add a dialoshinsky morilla term and see what this term does. <coughs> but there was a shorter route, that is, since we have three of these guys uh, intertwined in the three regions, in fact, this is in the intermediate region, but if you look what happens at what happens in the spiral phase, you also have three spiral phase, three spirals on each of the sublattices and also here. So what we did was to propose uh, the spins I in a similar answers. Okay, don't okay. So this is how how to derive the the effective action. So essentially, you develop your spin, the three spins o of the triangle around the let's say the center of the triangle, S J, and then derivative expansion, and then you keep the lowest uh, lower derivative terms in the action. This with some kind of uh, straightforward algebra. And you can rewrite the outcome uh, in a very simple way. So you have the sum of three Hamiltonians, which are HIs here. And if you remember, this is precisely what I have shown you before. This is nonlinear sigma model term. This is the continuum expression of the Jaloshinsky moria term, and this is the Seaman term. Okay? So what does it mean? Well, it means that this is a very simple system where each sublattice can be described by these uh, continuous uh, fields. But then you have to put them together, and this is uh, done by this term here. So M is the sum of these three guys. M is not an independent variable. And this will impose a constraint. And, and essentially what we'll tell you is how these P sublattices have to accommodate, not one on top of the other, but some uh, at some um, different uh, some distances. Uh between uh, the centers of the schemes on each sublattice. <coughs> okay, so if you do that and you propose now, now you have this effective action, and then the question is can you reproduce the phase diagram of cell numerically? Well, you have to do some work. So you have three regions one is a spiral phase, and the well, let me, I will me refer to the one of the sublattices. So on each sublattice, you have a spiral, skimmy lattice, and then uh, saturation. And this is known. I mean, this was done by Bogdanov, Yablonsky, Nagaosa, and many others. Uh, essentially, if you want to reproduce, if you want to reproduce something like this, essentially what you have to do is to super combine three different uh, spirals. Okay? If you combine three different spirals, then you get this uh, lattice here. So three different spirals like this. No? One in this direction, another in the, uh, and in the three cues in the three directions of the triangular lattice. And then you get this. This using this knowledge, this is uh, this would be the N for one of the schemal lattices on one of the sublattices of the triangular. And then you have three of them put together, compute the energy. Okay, the three are very similar, but they are translated by some uh, uh, some T1 and T2 that you have to fix minimizing the energy. And you reproduce this, this uh, uh, from this ansatz here, minimizing T1 and T2, and the phase diagram qualitati qualitatively uh, reproduces what I have shown you before. So this is magnetization, MZ. So uh, is one is red is uh, from this model, and green is uh, from numerics. <coughs> and you can also check the topological charge and uh well everything seems to be in the in the right uh, way as i said before i was convinced that uh this is a vortex lattice and uh 
but we, my, my student Santiago Osorio did uh, uh, computation, I mean, a kind of uh, deformation of the lattice in this, in this uh, scheme. Uh, so taking, taking this, uh, these ansatz and splitting uh, very little one sublattice with respect to the other. And what he started to observe is that uh, in these regions in, in between, there are vortices that appear. So if you compute the circulation here, you get zero, but if you do it here or there, you get charge one, okay? And since these are set to vortices, this is at least is consistent. <coughs> so we, at the moment, are trying to get really convinced that these are vortices and uh, it's not yet clear. Okay, so uh, another thing that uh, we are doing now with uh, another student and Flavia is uh, to see what happens in the Kagome lattice. Well, it turned out to be much more difficult as one would uh, have expected. But I was not so pessimistic at the beginning, even if the Kagome lattice is much more complicated. Here we have the aloshinsky moriya term and the magnetic field. So I was expecting this to kill this uh, huge degeneracy that uh, uh, makes the Kagome lattice so complicated at zero field and uh, low temperature. Mm. So there are some materials, for example, Herbert Smithite, that have these uh <coughs> Kagome planes with uh, also the aloshinsky moriya interactions. So from the information I got from uh, Philip Mendes and collaborators, uh, they are uh, considering now the model with the aloshinsky moriya interactions in plane and out of plane. So our model could be, uh, could have some uh, relation to this system. So essentially we copycat what di we did in the triangular case, except that now we have a uh, Kagome, okay? And numerics in some, uh, for some fields and the Alcinski moriya couplings uh, leads to a picture that resembles the picture I have shown you before is here, it resembles this picture here, but uh, if there is we didn't find a way, let me put it this way. We didn't find a way to uh, split this into sublattices in order to recover the picture that I have shown you before that was uh, for me so nice. I mean, if you take this, it looks ugly, but you split it in three sublattices and you get on each of these sublattices a scheme lattice. So I was expecting the same here, and we tried many things. So Kagome is more complicated, so maybe this is Q equals zero state in each sublattice or square root of three on each sub. So we tried many things and so far uh, we are still struggling to characterize this. But, uh, okay, so there is some, uh, some <coughs> interesting intermediate phase uh, that seems to be, uh, seems to have some uh, uh, vorticity uh, in there. Okay, so this is uh, what we did and we are doing. An another interesting project we started more recently is uh, uh, what happens if you uh, apply an electric field. And there are papers where Okamura and collaborators, and also now our collaborators, Jonathan White and others, Oksana Saharko from PSI in uh, Willigen, Switzerland, uh, they are, uh, th what they can show is that if you get, uh, let, let's focus on this picture. So you have magnetic field and temperature, and here you have, so this, this is a three-dimensional case, okay? Uh, so that's why you need finite temperature and finite field. So you are there, here is uh, zero field, and you have your ischemia phase. And then you apply uh, some uh, electric field in one direction or in the, in the other, and then this makes your Schemian lattice uh, phase larger or smaller. In the, uh, well, this can be, if you make uh, your uh, sample thinner, then these uh, regions uh, can become uh, very, very large. So this is very a very large uh, stable schemian lattice, and you may have also metastable regions. So what we are doing now is trying to see what happens. Uh, so what, what is the origin of this metastability and this enhancement of this, this phase? Uh, but this is, uh, for the moment, we have no results. Uh, another project uh, 
we started is to see what happens if you couple fermions on top of these backgrounds. Um, okay, so this uh, it was animated, but the PDF killed the animation. But essentially, if you have a strong Kuhn coupling, as uh, we heard today, this uh, the spin of the electron will follow the spin of the of the background. But there will be some uh, back reactions, and this is what uh, people started to study. For example, recent paper by Motome and collaborators in 2017, and this is what I have mentioned before. They, they have shown that there is a phase <coughs> in a very simple electronic system coupled to, to this uh, background where biskirmions appear. So biskirmions uh, means... Uh, I don't like a bischemius. I prefer schemius of charge two. It's not just two schemius of charge one that are uh, in a close by, but I I this is uh, another topological sector. And uh, so essentially, in this picture, you see this is a topo the topological charge as a function of the field, in uh <coughs> and you have uh, at very low fields charge two, and if you increase the field, you get charge one and then charge zero. Schemius. And the nice thing is that uh, these, these kind of profiles uh, have also been observed experimentally by Ying Zhang and collaborators, well, in these very complicated compounds. And, uh, okay, and this was uh, mixed up. <coughs> and in this paper, Ying Zhang and collaborators, what they have observed, well, this is the structure of the material, which has a large cell. Uh, but if you look at the uh, magnetic field versus temperature um, phase diagram, you get this intermediate phase that instead of being a schemial lattice, it's a bischemial lattice. So these are the images they have that they claim that uh, corresponds to charge two schemions. These are experimental data and then fits with some uh, program they have to, <coughs> to compute uh, topological charges. Okay, so... I'm ahead of time, that's good. So let me summarize. So w in the antiferromagnetic systems, uh, although we don't have yet uh, candidates, uh, some uh, very nice uh, structure shows up, which uh, I believe, still believe, that is a Cetus vortex lattice, and which is composed for of three intertwined antiferromagnetic, sorry, three intertwined schemion uh, lattices of the standard type. Okay, I haven't uh, said anything about the stability, but uh, we have observed some that these phases are stable uh, because of the topological uh, protection, even if it is a lattice uh, problem. And then, uh, while well, um, my student Santiago Soria is finishing a paper on the deformation of schemions, uh, how these uh, schemions uh, are affected by electric fields and other perturbations. And the coupling to charge carriers is also in progress. And then why is this interested? interesting? Okay, one of the things they, they want to use it is for data storage. So you have either a scheme or nothing. And that means one or zero. Uh, spin and electron transport is being um, studied also because apparently you need very, very low electric fields to move these guys. <coughs> very low currents to move these guys as compared to other uh, domains, magnetic domains. And uh, more recently, uh, I got interested in this, uh, okay, there's a P missing, it's not cooling, it's uh, coupling. Uh, Magnetoelectric coupling via this uh, schemium. So the, the fact that there's this uh, um, out of plane, or let me say non-coplanar stru spin structure can generate some uh, uh, coupling between the electric degrees of freedom and uh, the, the magnetic degrees of freedom. And uh, this word is becoming very common in the literature now. So there was even a conference recently, uh, this in the title. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>